This is a view of two separate reconstructions. You'll find one of these in our textbook. I'll look at figures uh, 4, 4, 4, 5, and 4, 6, and you'll see the reconstructions in an interior shot and also a plan of this site. Uh, this is the largest and best preserved, at least today, of these sites on the island of Crete. These things are difficult to define. They were administrative centers, ritual centers, centers where the public could come to watch ritual performances. And at the same time, there were also large storage centers. So it's kind of hard to put a name on them. Uh, it would be another example of art being available for ordinary people to view, uh, not being restricted to the tomb or to the temple. In this particular case, we actually think if you go right here, you can see an open courtyard. That's where we think that the bull leaping ceremony took place. This uh, reconstruction, all of them actually, helps us to see that this is really a pretty rambling plan. Uh, there is no formal symmetry here, and that would be typical of the Minoan sensibilities in terms of design. Uh, when Arthur Evans, and again that's the guy who does the restoration of this place after buying it, when Arthur Evans goes here and looks at it and begins working working here. He suggests that because it reminds him of the Greek myth of King Minos and the labyrinth uh, in which the Minotaur, half human and animal, was hidden, uh, that he decided that he would call this entire civilization, excuse me, entire civilization, uh, the Minoan civilization. So it is named basically after after that myth. Uh, the entire way in which we approach the Minoans then has been framed by this man who was doing reconstruction here in the early 20th century. Um, it is based upon a much later Greek myth. It very clearly, however, does show us the rambling nature and the uh, sense of unevenness and almost the sense that the site grows out of the landscape, that it belongs as a part of the landscape. It also shows us that the Minoans had a great love of comfort. Uh, it in sections goes up to five levels. Uh, the average level would be about three. And as the Minoans build up, they attempt to make the environment for the people inside as comfortable and po as possible. They do this in part by, we would probably call them skylights, uh, but back in the day, uh, we could think of them perhaps more accurately as window wells. If you see the openings in the ceilings here in the roof, um, what this is doing is letting air and light into the inside. In addition to letting air and light in, uh, the Minoans also had piping that brought water into the structure. So they were going for a certain level of comfort. Uh, this is an interior view of one of those light wells, uh, figure 4-6 in our textbook. And in this, you can see the light coming in, opening the space. The Minoans designed the interior in a very unique way with a series of columns and a column consists of a shaft, that's this part, with a capital up above it and the shaft and the capital that the Minoans create are incredibly unique. Uh, the cushioned capital at the top is reasonably unique to the Minoans. It will perhaps suggest the Doric order later on used by the ancient Greeks, but it is very, very singular in terms of its association with the Minoans. There's something else that's singular that nobody else on the planet came up with, and that is the columns actually taper at the base. And in my slides, I think you can maybe see it best over here. It's wider at the top and it's narrower at the bottom. We think that the Minoans were literally copying um, the shape of a tree trunk and that's what originally they used as columns to help to hold up the structure. So originally the columns were created in wood. 
The strange thing, however, is that they put the narrow end at the bottom and the wide end at the top. Everybody else, and particularly you'll see it with the Greeks, uses the wide end at the bottom. So do the Egyptians. And why do they do that? Because it suggests and also provides greater stability. So we have to ask the question, why did these folks do this? And we think that it was a design decision because by tapering the base, the Minoans managed to give us the illusion that the space was airier and more open than it actually was. It also gives a greater sense of delicacy to the architecture as the Minoans create a really a kind of mi miniature open courtyard inside their building, making it much more habitable and much more pleasant. Uh, this interior structure, what we look at today, we generally would say is bad reconstruction. When Arthur Evans was here, what he did was to replace the rotted away wooden columns, but he got the bright idea that he would replace it with a different kind of material. Those columns today, the shafts of those columns, are created in concrete. He also decided pretty much on his own by looking at referencing paintings and ceramics that these column shafts would be painted in bright red. So much of what we're seeing here is from the imagination of Arthur Evans. Let me just show you another one that will make that even clearer. The one in the upper right is heavily restored uh, with background painting on the wall and it does look really like it was painted yesterday and guess what? It pretty much was painted yesterday. The real problem with this is when you visit this site you cannot tell what is original and what is not. And that is one of the main reasons that we think that Arthur Evans did not follow what we count today as good rules of reconstruction. It also will be, should we ever go to restore this again in the future, it would be difficult to reverse what Evans has done. Uh, I know it's possible, but concrete is a pretty permanent material. The problem with even thinking about restoring Evans' work is that it's been in position for around a hundred years. It now too is historical because it documents the way in which back in the day people could without any outside control or archaeological training restore ancient monuments. This also is a wake-up call to let you know when you go to museums and you look at ancient works of art one of the questions you should be asking is has this been restored and if it has been is the restoration accurate? This is a set of slides also from Kenosis, uh, more of Evans' work in the site, and that would include, if we go up here, a large set of uh, horns of a bull, and those are authentic, they're real, they come from the site, uh, it's just that where Evans put them, we don't know if that's where they or originally were located. Um, the restoration equally, again, some of Evans' handiwork here with, you can see the column, and you can also see a, a painting on the wall of a leaping bull. Uh, let me give you uh, a little proof of the liberty that Mr. Evans took with his site. Uh, when I was first investigating these, I thought, oh, well, um, Evans would have taken a lot of photographs, so we ought to know what everything here looks like, because he was certainly working here after photography was invented. And I discovered largely he took few photographs. Instead, he did sketches in his notebook, and he took notes. We do have some, though, and if you look at the photograph in the top right, that is the original of what this looked like. And then go to the top left, that is Evans' reconstruction. And what he's done has been to take, if you go here, you're going to see the chair. That's this chair. He's taken that setting with that chair and literally turned it into a throne room. However, we do not know if it really was a throne room, and we also don't know if the background decoration actually looked that way. So Mr. Evans has allowed his own imagination to create our version of the site of Kenosis today. There is hope of having a source for 
untampered with Minoan artworks. And those pieces would come from the island of Thera, present day name Santorini. And that is, well, I think you can find it in the upper right. That is because uh, some centuries ago, there was a humongous volcanic eruption there. The map that's located on the left gives you an idea of how bad that eruption was. It's certainly one of the largest volcanic eruptions that the Earth has known. The core of the island itself blew out. So if we go over here, I'd like you to imagine once upon a time, this was a solid line and the entire interior of that island was earth. Uh, in the time of the Romans, the core was beginning to return and it was beginning again to display volcanic uh, activity. You can see in fact a photograph of what it looks like. That's a 20th century photograph in the lower uh, right side of, of my screen. Uh, this humongous explosion buried buildings and towns under huge tons of ash and, ash and lava. And one of them, Akrotiri, right down here, is a site of ongoing archaeological excavation. Uh, we have been, we think, able to date the explosion to 1628 BCE. So we do, if that date is correct, we do know that the Minoan civilization survived it and went on and actually prospered after this took place. This is one of the most impressive of the recoveries from Thera. Uh, it is uh, among the earliest known examples of landscape painting. In other words, the subject is not with a narrative content, not about humans. It is focusing instead simply on nature. And it again gives us, I'm going to say nature in motion here, because the entire landscape itself seems to be um, moving, at least the lilies certainly do, as if there is a breeze blowing on a nice spring day. This is like some of the best of the works coming out of uh, the Minoan production. An example of a true fresco. That means it's painted directly on wet plaster. That encourages reduced detail and it also encourages our artists to work very quickly. In addition to that, the colors are absorbed. They blend into the plaster, making them permanent, but also the color, the intensity of the color is reduced as it is absorbed. We do call it the spring fresco. And I think you can figure out why. It is a, a painting that looks like it takes place as nature is being renewed. Uh, there is a sense of motion in the lilies. You can see curving shapes in the leaves of the plant and then the flowers that begin to, and some of them are still buds, uh, to open and to blossom. Right next to those flowers, those lilies, there are also a couple birdies. And I realize that this might look like a cute painting of a couple birds, but uh, bird experts have looked at this and said, ah, those are swallows. But you know what? They're two male swallows. And what they're doing is contesting over territory. And that is something that would take place in the springtime when males are seeking territory so that they can find a mate and reproduce. Uh, the energy here, the activity, the curving lines of the landscape, uh, the flowing sense of this is typical of Minoan art and uh, style overall, sense of design overall. If you compare it to the details from the New Kingdom in Egypt, which are in the upper right, and those are fabulous pictures, but you can see the birds in flight there actually seem to be somewhat stiff and frozen in comparison to the works that the Minoans are producing. The curving lines and the sense of energy in this picture, then a kind of room that encloses us within nature, uh, is very typical of the style of the ancient Minoans. You've got a couple different birdies to look at. Looks like the males are kind of bumping chests, get out of my territory. So it's an accurate portrayal of nature as well. The Minoans uh, produced an amazing civilization. We do think the real end of the Minoan world came with conquest by outsiders, and those outsiders come from Mycenae.